Okay, and yes. That's fine, Joshua. Um, if Go ahead and disconnect and reconnect. I know that your internet can be a little bit uh, wonky. So, um, yeah, it's cool. So, we're talking about files. Um, data storage. The difference, the main difference that we are getting into is everything up until now, all of the data, all the stuff you, the user inputs, everything has been, only exists within the running program. We've never had data that we could store outside the running program. This week that changes. Now we're going to persist data to the drive separate from the program so that file will live on whether or not your Python script is running. And that's pretty powerful. Um, databases are files. Large databases are files. Of course they have their own database systems running around them, but they're files. Um, Microsoft, your Microsoft Office documents, they're files. Your .py files are files, even though when you execute them, they tell the computer to do things. So files are everywhere. All right, so we've got some new stuff for files this week. We're going, we have a new function called open, a new function called close, read, and a new keyword called with. Open that does just what it says. It opens a file and gets you a file descriptor. Close returns that file descriptor to the system. Read actually is what gets the stuff out of the file. And with negates the need for close because if you have an open, you have to have a close. And we'll get into a little bit more of that. So everything is a file on a computer. The operating system is a file. Okay, this presentation is a file. Everything is a file. Even the executables that run your Python is a file. Um, so there's just so many. Images are files. Everything is a file on a file uh, on a computer. Um, and, but every time you access the file, you're going to interact with the file system. Now this is important because things act differently a little bit for different file systems. But you have to remember that a file is a resource. And opening a file uses a system resource. So that system resource has to be returned. So what can I do with a file? Well, we, we all know my, my love for this term CRUD. We can create it, read it, update, and delete it. Create it tells the operating system to write a file, a new file to disk. Reading it says get me the data from the file. Updating it says change what's in that stored file and delete it removes the file from the drive. Um, a little bit about operating systems. This is just for you guys to understand. You won't have to do anything with it this week. Um, there are different operating systems. The, the big ones are Windows, Linux, and Mac, but you also have like a Cray computer system. All of them handle files differently. Linux and Mac are pretty close because the Mac OS is somewhat based on Linux, but they all handle files differently. And that means the way we have to interact with the operating system differs a little bit. So if I am just writing a program that sits on top of an operating system without any intermediary, I've got to probably write a different program for each operating system I'm running it on. And if you're writing something in, say, C or C++, then you're going to have to have a different program for each, not just because you'd have to compile it differently, but if you're interacting with the file system, you'll have to interact differently for each of the operating systems you run on. Python solves that problem for us 
because Python is an intermediary between what we want done and the operating system. So instead of having to ha instead of having to write different code for different operating systems, you can write it once and run it on any of the operating systems so you don't have to worry about it. And it's called write once run many. Another another language that does that is Java and Rust does it as well. So you can in some ways ignore the specifics of the operating system by using something like Python. So a file has properties. Okay, a file has a name, it's got a size, and it's got a location on disk. The name is whatever the name is. In this case, in my little blue box there, I've got a name called myfirstfile.txt. Uh, it's 28 bytes, and it's Location is in home L Shannon. Now, for those who are not Unix or Mac people, it would be C colon users L Shannon. Um, but that is not the file data. That is the data about the file. Um, the contents of the file are in blue, and it is this is a file with two lines. So there's two different things here. There is the information about the file, and then there's the contents of the file. And you need both of those, because you're going to have to know how to get to the file. You've got to know its name. You've got to know where it is. And in some cases, you're going to want to know the size of the file, because sometimes if you're dealing with large files, you may want to chunk that file up as you're reading it in. Um, these properties are called metadata because they are the data about the file. Um, and we're about to talk about something called the file object or the file descriptor. And hold on, let me go back. I got ahead of myself. Crud, there we go. Um, there's a file object and it's called a file descriptor. And that file descriptor, you get to it by giving it the name and the location and what you want to do. And using that file descriptor, you can get to the data. So when we think about files, we think about what's in the file. What I'm trying to say here is we have to think about um, the data we have to think about the properties of the file as well. Not just what's in it, but how big it is and where in the world it is on a disk. Okay, so CRUD, C-R-U, but not D for a file. Before you can do anything with the file, you have to open the file, okay? This is how you do it in Python. I have the variable my file. I know my file is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign is a function called open. I know it's a function because it's got parentheses. Inside that are two arguments. There's myfirstfile.txt in quotes and r. So what do I have here? I have my file is going to be the file descriptor. This contain, a file descriptor contains the properties of the file. It contains its name, it contains its size, it contains where it is on disk. Um, and it is also how you get at the contents of the file. You can't get to the contents of the file without getting the file descriptor. And open gives you that descriptor. So I have my first TXT. This is the fully qualified path to the file. Now, for most of what we're going to do, we're not going to have to give it um, a directory structure. If I needed to give it a directory structure, I could do that here. But for what we're going to need, it's the file name. And it needs to be the full file name. If there's an extension, you got to have the extension on it. Um, some operating systems are case sensitive and some aren't. Uh, my suggestion is you treat it as case sensitive for Zybooks. 
And we have this thing R. R is the mode. A mode is what I'm allowed to do to the file. I can read it only. I can write it only. I can append to it or I can treat it as a binary file. Reading is just that. I'm just going to read the data in. I'm going to do something with it. I am not allowed to modify the data of the file. Write is just that. I'm not allowed to read it, but I'm going to write to the file. And a pen says, I'm going to add to the bottom of the file. Write, if you say write, it will overwrite anything that's currently in the file. If you say append, it will always add to the file. And binary, we're just going to talk about it really quickly. It basically is just a different way to format data that's not necessarily human readable. Modes can be combined. So you can have RW, which would be read write. Or you can have RA, which would be read append. So don't forget the mode. Now, once you've opened a file and gotten the file descriptor, you have to remember to close the file. This is where I'm going to sound like a broken record this week. Opening file, opening, open gives you a file descriptor. Closed returns the file descriptor to the system. So you have to remember to do that because there are a finite number of descriptors on the file system. So always remember to close if you've opened. Now, in Zybooks it probably won't matter because you're not going to be opening and closing enough. If you're out there in the real world programming and you are opening a lot of files and not closing them, eventually you will run out of file descriptors and then you can't do anything else with your system until you give those file descriptors back or you kill the program that has them. Um, if the file exists in a location specified, Python will open it. If it doesn't exist, Python will create the file when using W or R. And then down here on the bottom for the pretty much every slide, I'm going to say don't forget to close. All right, how do you get data from a file? We just figured out how to get information about the file and this thing called the file descriptor, which will let me get the data. Um, so how do I get to it? Well, I read it. So I've opened my file for reading. So now I'm going to use the my file variable, which contains the descriptor, and I'm going to read it. And how I do that is I'm going to use that dot notation that we've talked about before. So I'm on my file, I'm going to read. So I'm going to say my file dot read, open and close parentheses. And what this says Python is, hey Python, I've got this file descriptor. Go get me all of the data in that file and give it back to me as a string. So my stir will contain the information that's in the file. It's read into the running program, just like if I had if somebody had said input and I typed a bunch of stuff in, that exists in the running program. Well, if I get it out of file, when I, when I say myfile.read and I have a variable on the left-hand side that now exists in my Python script so that I can do something with it, whatever do something is. So um, it retrieves read, and there are different ways to do it. Read is not the only way to do it, but um, read will get all of the contents from the file descriptor and it ha from the file as long as you have given it the right file descriptor. And so what happens is here what I get is this is a text file slash n with two lines. So that is that's what I get. I'm just getting a big long string. And it's just like input. Python's going to assume that it's get being given a string when it opens a file unless you do something different, unless you convert it somehow. Okay, and please always remember to close your file. So 
maybe I want to read my file as a list. And I want the list separator to be that new line that we saw last time. So I do pretty much the same thing. I'm going to open it for reading. And instead of just saying read lines, sorry, read, I'm now going to have a file called read lines. So read lines will say for every new line, give me another element in my list. So what this gives me is a list. This is a file with two lines. So if you have a lab that says read it in as a list, or if you have created, you know, all these things in a file, and you've separated them by new lines, and you need to get them back in as a list, this is the way to do it. Read lines just does it for you. And close the file. So now I want to read it line by line. Let's say I am processing some data. And I need to, to do something with that data for each and every line. I need to examine it before I do anything with it. Well, there's another way to read that data. And that is using a for loop. Because a, a, a file is just a bunch of strings, I can say for line in my file. And what that does is Python will simply treat your file as a list as long as there are new lines to separate, as long as there are either hard returns or slash ends. So each line, line is a variable, just like Fred. doesn't matter what the name of it is. It is where it's the variable that Python is going to put that whatever line you're on in the file. And the way you can look, think of it as, is you've got a little arrow. And that arrow goes to each and every line. And when that arrow is on the first line, the value of that line variable is going to be this is a file. And when it's on the second line of this, of my file, it's going to be with two lines. So if I print line, it's going to print this is a file. I go back up to the for loop. I'm going to get the next line. And it's going to print with two lines. So that's one way. Because you always have to remember to close the file. There is also, um, let's see, I think I've said all this. It's a system resource. So you got to remember to close it. Um, open gets it, right, uh, right, okay, you want to write any changes made to the file and the file object is no longer connected to file. So that's why you have to close. The close writes the data from the running program in RAM to the hard drive. Now, why wouldn't you just write it letter by letter by letter? Because the most expensive single operation you can do on a computer is to write to disk. Either read from or write to disk. Very expensive operations. Um, now, we're not talking for an individual operation. We're not talking seconds. We're talking microseconds. However, when you do a lot of them, they add up. So you want to be careful when you're doing your writes. And that's why a lot of, a lot of programming languages require, will, will not guarantee that anything is written to the disk without you closing. So let's look at that a little, a little more. So, I've got, I'm going to write to a file. I have a file called myemptyfile.txt. And in the middle, I have this thing called a buffer. That buffer is running in, is sitting in RAM. It's sitting in the running memory of my Python program. But it is certainly not on disk. It is 
It exists only in the memory of my running Python. So if I killed my program before I wrote, before that stuff was actually sent to disk, I'd lose all of it. So when I'm writing, I'm writing to the buffer. And you don't have any control over this, by the way. This is simply how it works. Now, if I close, the buffer gets written to my file. And I have my empty file now has two lines in it. Now, one of the things I did here differently is when you see the open here, the open, the mode is W. So I opened it for writing. So Python created my empty file.txt. It was, in fact, empty, and I wrote to it. If I wanted to read and write at the same time, I would have done RW. But this is the way it looks. So when you're thinking about writing to a file, when you use the write function, sorry, I didn't even say that. What function do you use when you write to a file? You use the function called write. And the argument to the write function is going to be whatever you want to put in that file on that line. That's it. That's all it is. Um, and you're going to assume that you're writing a string. Everything's a string. So you use the write function. The write function puts it in the buffer. The close function mostly puts it in the file. Sometimes if the buffer gets full, Python will flush it to the disk. And then it will continue on with the buffer. Usually you have to have a lot of data for it to do that. But close guarantees that everything from the buffer went to the disk. How do I write to a file before I close it? There's another function. It's called flush. So let's say I have a big file and I want to put big file in my file 100 times. So I have my file. I have opened a file called mybigfile.txt for writing. So I'm just going to say for counter in range 100, I'm going to say myfile.write big file. So I'm going to write big file, and I'm going to write it again, and I'm going to write it again. So now, I, but I, every tenth one, I want to flush, I, I want to put it into the actual file on disk. So I'm going to basically say for every 10 lines, I'm going to flush the file descriptor. So the flush function actually forces a write to disk. It doesn't wait till the buffer is full. It says whatever is in the buffer now, put it on disk. This is very handy because sometimes you want to uh, manage your own buffer. Now, and, and it won't just be to necessarily files on disk. We had a problem with our, not really a problem, we caught a bug. Um, where things weren't working the way we expected them to with one of the databases that we use, and it turned out we just needed to flush the buffer. So it's sometimes you will have to manage that yourself. In this class, you won't. But remember, you can flush the buffer, and that will put it to disk. And then please close, even if you flushed it, Please remember to close because not only does it write any additional data to the file, it will return the file descriptor to the system. And I promise we'll look at some code here real quick. Uh, if you're dealing with large data sets, you might want to remember to flush. And then my file.txt has lots of big files. Okay, so now we're going to manage a file with the word with. With is a new keyword. And the nice thing about with is you don't have to close the file. With is a loop. So what you are doing when you are starting a statement with the word with, you are going to open a file and it's going to then loop through everything in the file. So in this case, I've got the keyword with, 
and afterward I'm going to have open myfile.txt and this will open it for reading. I've got the keyword as and then I've got the name of the file descriptor. A my file is just a variable name. It could be any variable name. It could have been Fred. And then colon. Please remember the colon because this is in fact a loop. So what will happen here is I will simply say whatever my file my file descriptor is, I'm going to say line equal my file dot read line, and then I'm going to print the line. That's all I'm going to do here. You're going to use this when you open a comma separated value file. Um, now the file will be closed automatically. When you exit this loop that starts with with, everything is done automatically. You don't have to worry about closing anything. It just does it because you're using the with loop. So if you know that you're going to be processing your file line by line, it is always my suggestion that you use the keyword with. Use that loop. And by the way, that loop can only be used with files. With cannot be used with any other kind of looping or branching. Uh, let's go and look at a little bit of code. Yes. So if you need to use the file for two different updates, you would then speedster the files with name in main. Not sure I get that, Joshua. So if I have a file and I want to put two different updates in it, I'm not with name in main. I'm confused. Separate. You would then separate the files with name in main. Yes. If you want to use the file twice for two different updates, you would then separate the files with name in main. Yes. I believe so. And you're talking about one of the labs? Yeah. So let's go and look at width. So I have a file, manylines.txt. Here's manylines.txt. It's just four lines. But I'm going to open that file. I'm going to read the lines. And then I'm going to, I don't know, print line in FL print line. I don't know why I did that. So let's see what I meant by doing that. Uh, 7.9. Ah, okay. Let's go back to this one. So, I'm going to edit configuration. I'm going to do with.py. And I'm going to debug it because we like the debugger. So, I don't have any variables. I'm on my variables tabs under frames and variables. And I'm going to step over my width. So what we'll see here is we're going to see a text IO wrapper. Name is manylines.txt. Mode is R for read. This is in fact my file descriptor. And it's just titled F. That's the name of the variable. If I look at this file descriptor, I have a lot of information. It's not, it's closed is false, the encoding is UTF-8, errors are strict, line buffering is false, it's for read mode, I got the name, I got the new lines, I got write through false. So here are just some of the metadata you get with that file descriptor. So now I'm going to step over and I now have FL. Ah, so I read lines. So read lines gave me the contents as a list. So I have one, two, three, and four. Line one, line two, line three, line four. Now I'm just going to go into a loop for line in FL. I'm just going to print it. That's all I'm going to do. 
So that was just a quick explanation, a quick demonstration of how, read, how you could use with and read lines. Now, let's say that I wanted to use width to read the lines, but I wanted to do something with it later. So I could simply have, I could just have an FL here. Then I'm going to say FL equal read lines. Let's just do this. Let's actually do this. Let me take this and put it out here. So here's a way to use these lines of data outside that width because that can be important sometimes. So all I did was I defined a variable FL up here so it's available outside of this loop and then I can use it in this loop. So let's debug. So I'm going to step over look at my variables. FL is none right now. FL is now the list. I'm just going to print it and now when I'm down at this for loop if I look at FL here I have everything I need. So if you're doing a lab and you want to use with but you want, need to process some of that data outside that with loop this is how you do it. And then, of course, I can just go through and print all the lines. Uh, where am I? Okay. This is just a, lot, a little bit about working with the operating system. As I said, Windows, Linux, and Mac are operating system. Python will neutralize the OS, OS differences if you need to. Now I just wanted to bring this up. It's not required for any labs. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. Python modules. We haven't really touched much on modules, but modules are one of the things that give Python its strength out in the real world. A module is just a library of code. It's really just a file a .py file with a bunch of code that has been usually meant for a single purpose. Um, it can hold functions, it can hold class definitions, and there are just thousands of them out there. There's Pygame if you want to build your own games in Python. There's Django which is a whole web, web engine that's built in Python. And that's actually more than a single module. There's the time module and the OS module, which is something we're going to use. OS allows you to interact with the operating system. So how do I handle a module? There is a keyword called import. Import basically says, Python, go out and get me a file that is named whatever.py. In this case, I have import OS. OS is actually the name of a Python file. Somewhere out there in your install for Python, there is a file called os.py. And that has all of the OS functionality, which is what we need if we're going to make things like path separators manageable. So imports the keyword, and it tells to go get an external script, OS is the name of the module, and by the way, you can create your own modules. Now, if I wanted to create a file path that was home L Shannon module 6 lecture.key, I would simply use the OS function join. Now, here's the dot notation, but it's a little different. Instead of join acting on an OS object, what this is saying, if, you, if, if I have imported OS, what os.join says to Python is, Python, out of the OS module, get me the join function and then execute it. So in this case, the dot notation is really positional because it's telling you, or it's location-based. It's telling you where to get, whoops, the join function. Let's go back.
And here basically what I'm doing is I'm getting something out of a directory path, but I'm not having to deal with the slashes. So what Python will do for Linux is it will get me home L Shannon module six lecture dot key. And on Windows, it will get me the opposite direction. Now these don't exactly make sense because um, Python because Linux has like slash home and Windows has C colon users. But you could see how to make this work and more reasonable um, with different operating systems. So this is just this is just really quick. Binary data. I just wanted to introduce the concept that there is non-human readable data out there. In fact, most stuff is non-human readable. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it's in some kind of binary specific format and that format is usually meant for a specific purpose. GIF, JPEG, movie, Microsoft Office. You ever tried opening Microsoft Office document in a text editor? That's what a binary file looks like. And um, it's handled differently than all of the other stuff we've done because all the other stuff we've done is human readable. And the way we do that is to use B. So there is a predecessor for um, Python when you are talking about a string. So the predecessor is B and B says Python treat the string to the right of me as binary. So in this case my underscore bytes equal B colon bytes end quote sorry quote bytes end quote will actually have uh, Python treated as binary bytes rather than strings, rather than a string. So that's what that B is there and it's special. And if I print my bytes or type my bytes, it's going, uh, yeah, not going to worry about that much because now we're going to get into what we're doing with the labs this week. The labs this week are non-trivial. In fact, one of the labs is almost like um, it's almost like a, its own project, and I didn't pick it, but I'm apologize for it. Um, if you are stuck between getting the labs done and getting your project in, it is my advice to get your project in because remember, you the the way the school works is you've got two weeks, even though you'll lose a little bit of points on the lab, you got two weeks to get those labs in. So you can get your project done and then worry about the lab if you can't get it all done. Just a little piece of advice. So comma separated value files. Comma separated value files are basically columnar data. They're like a spreadsheet. They're, they're often used when you're, when you're seeing matrices, that's comma separated value data. And um, there is a module in Python called CSV and it helps process comma separated value format data and it's required for lab 7.8. So what's a CSV file? Comma delimited, comma delimited data. Um, so it's going to create a list from the contents of word.csv, removing the duplicate words as you build the list. I'm going to import a module called CSV. So Python is going to bring in a file into your running application space called CSV. And now I'm going to create a word list. That word list is going to contain unique words from my words.csv file. So I'm going to open with open CSV as words. So I'm going to have a variable words that is my uh, file descriptor into my CSV file. So now 
because I have this thing called, I've imported CSV, CSV has a function called reader. And reader will basically take all of the information in my words.csv and read it in as a list. And so now what I can do, because CSV has cat in the hat, hat in the hand as a list, I can go through that list and I can create a new list where it only has unique words in it. So that's what I do here. Okay, in case there are multiple lines in the file, we're going to do a four. So now I have four counter in range len row. So I have a row. In this case, there's only one. But what I'm doing is I'm saying four counter in the row. And then I'm going to say if the counter is not in word list. So here is where we can use in with a list, word list, and not because we haven't really used the negation of in before, but you can say not in, and if the word you're looking for is not in the list, this will evaluate to true. If it's not in the list, then I'm simply going to append that word to my word list. And then I'm going to print the word list when I'm done. So this is a CSV example that might be something like the, um, the lab 7.8 that you're going to have to do. Okay, so you've got a CSV file. You're going to read in the CSV file. You're going to use the CSV module to import everything from words with a delimiter comma into something called content. Content is a list. That list contains everything in the file, so it might be a list of lists. And then you treat it as a list of lists, and you go through each element in the list, and you determine whether or not it is in your final list, which was defined outside the with statement. So word underscore list, it's very important that that, that this, sorry, that this right here, word list, has been defined outside this with statement because you're going to have to use it outside the with statement. And this is in common delimited.py, and we can look at that in just a minute. List to a dictionary. We talked about this a little bit last week. We're going to talk about it just a bit more right now because you're going to have to change a list and make it into a dictionary for 7.9. And this is one of those things that I think students find a little tricky sometimes. So I have the contents of dict.txt, and it contains key value pairs, but they're stored in different lines um, as a value. So they're not stored in name colon Lisa. There's a line with name, and then there's a line with Lisa. Um, so the key is in the first line and the value is in the second. But I want to create a dictionary where I have the key value pair. So how do I do that? Well, for right now, I'm not going to open the file and read it because we've learned how to do that. So I'm going to end up having the contents of a file. Let's assume I use read lines. And it's going to be name, comma, Lisa, answer, comma, 42, amount, 3.14. And so I'm going to create an empty dictionary. This empty dictionary is outside my for loop on purpose because I'm going to need it later. So I'm basically going to run through the contents of my list. And I'm going to say for counter plus one less than the length of contents and counter modulo two zero. Then I'm going to have if the contents of counter is not in the dictionary, then I'm basically going to add my dict contents of counter equal contents of counter plus one. Because if I look at this, I have zero is name, I can point at least, zero is name, one is Lisa, two is answer, 
3 is 42, 4 is amount, 5 is 3.14. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So my if statement is set up specifically to make sure the first part of this if statement is I'm at counter. It's counter plus 1 less than the length of contents because I don't want to walk off here at 5. And if that's true, and counter is modulo 2, so it's even. So it's got to be 0, 2, 4. Then I'm going to say if contents of counter is not in the dictionary. So this is going to be contents of counter, this is going to be contents of counter, or the amount is going to be contents of counter. If it is not currently in the dictionary, because you never know, I'm going to then add it to the dictionary. So contents of counter is the key. Contents of counter plus 1 is the value. This adds it to the dictionary. Perfect. So now when I'm done, I can say for key in my dict, print key colon value, format key comma my dict of key. So that is how you go from a list to a dictionary which is what you're going to have to do in 7.9. So let's talk about the labs, and then we will go back, and I will answer any questions, and we can go through any code. So word frequencies. This pseudocode looks suspiciously like, what was it? Like this. It's not. It's not exact. You're going to have to figure out where the differences are. But I have a file name, which you have to have an input statement here because Zybooks is going to tell you what the file name is. I'm going to create my empty list. I'm going to open my file for reading. And I'm going to say, while there are no more lines in the file. Now remember, pseudocode is language agnostic. So here you'll see that these two lines probably represent the with statement in Python. And then I'm going to set user file equal to the results of CSV file reader for CSV file with a delimiter of comma. So I've just basically said, use CSV reader and give me a list of all the comma separated stuff. So then I'm going to do a for loop. And I'm going to do a for row in uh, user file for index and length of row. So then I'm going to say if the value of row at index is not in the word list. I'm going to output the value and I'm going to append it to word list. And that's pretty much 7.8. 7.9 is a big one. Do I have any questions? Sorry, guys. OK. This, basically what you're doing is you are, oh, finding my spelling errors, um, you're basically taking one file. You are modifying the data. You're writing it out to a, sec a second file. And then you're reading it in. And then you're printing it out. So we're going to have a file name that's going to get input. We're going to set user file to opened file and output list to lines in user file. And then I'm going to create an empty dictionary, an empty list, and another empty list. So for index in length of output list. Now output list is the lines in the file. OK? So this was basically just get the name of the file in, open the file, read every single line out of the file. We're not using any with or anything like that. We're just saying read me the lines. So that would be read lines. OK, starting from the first item in the list and every other item in the list as key and every value between the value associated with the preceding. One of these days, I'll learn to spell. Probably not. Pro, pre, I think that's it. Sorry, I'm dyslexic. I don't always get it. Um, so if one key with multiple values append to the list. So here, this for loop 
is taking the contents of that data, each line, so I have a key on line 0, a value on line 1, a key on line 2, a value on line 3, ad infinitum until you're done with the file. So this is something like what we just looked at in that previous, in this code. So that's what this is. I am going to go through and I'm going to create a dictionary from individual lines in a file. Now, you may need to um, strip new lines. So there is a strip function that was talked about, oh, sorry about that, in 2.10. There we go. And um, so if list in object in my dictionary, remove new line from it and append, else remove new line from it and append, and then set it. OK. So that's the first part. You read in a file. You create a dictionary from the contents of the file. Second part. Now you've got to sort some stuff. So you've got things in a dictionary, and you're going to sort by keys, years, from least amount of years to greatest amount of years. So you're going to sort. So you're going to have a sorted dictionary to sorted my dict. So maybe there is a sorted function already out there for you for sorting lists. So you probably want to look for that. So I'm going to say set my dict sorted by keys to new dict populated by sorted. So there are several approaches to creating a dictionary in the third bullet, and you want to look at section 6.14 to do that. Then you're going to change it from a dictionary to a list. So you're going to take the basically each key and get the value. So you're going to take the values and just put those values in a list so that they are sorted. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, yeah. And then you're going to split the list into a single list, split the list of lists into a single list, and then you're going to uh, output the list. And then you're going to open output keys.txt for writing. And you're going to say for key value in my dict of sorted keys, you're going to convert the key to a string. You're going to write the key plus colon to the file. And then you're going to say for item in values colon one, write item plus semicolon to file. Then you're going to write value minus 1 to file, and you're going to write new line to file, and you're going to close the file. Now you're going to set F2 to output titles, and you're simply going to, for item in show list split, that other list that we created, we're going to write item plus new line to file, and then we're going to close the file. What Zybooks is going to grade you on is the contents of these two files. All that work is to get you to these two files. So um, you're need, going to need to do a little bit of common string slicing here. But you're going to have one file that basically has key colon value semicolon with a new line. And then you're going, and you have to remember to close. If you don't close, everything might not be written to file. And Python and Zybooks won't give you your full credit. Um, so, does anybody have any questions? Do you guys want to see anything? Or do you want to talk about your projects? Going once. Going twice. 
uh, the project. Mark, what would you like to talk about the, with about the project? You can open up the mic right now, by the way. Here. Everybody can okay. go ahead and talk if okay. they want. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, I'm doing all right I'm doing on, all right on, on um, but I'm but having, I'm having issues with uh, collecting the items. I, I just, I, I don't know. I'm just having issues with it. <laughs> Okay, that's not uncommon. There's a lot going on in the project. Okay. So when you say you're having co issues collecting the items, are you yeah. having issues with putting them into the list or getting double items in the list? How uh, is that working? I'm getting, I'm getting double items in the list. Um, and then, you know, when I, I, I just, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at <laughs> It's okay. No, no, no. There's nothing to be sorry about. So if you're getting double items in the list, when yeah. you are putting the items in the list, do you have an if statement to say if item not in whatever your item list is and then put it in the list? It sounds to me like you just need an if statement before you're actually appending to the list. No, I don't have the if statement, so that's probably where I'm going wrong. I might have missed it. Yeah, so it would be something along the lines of um, this. So now it's not going to be row counter, and it's not going to be word list, but if you say if whatever your item is not in whatever your item list is, then add it. You're only adding what's unique. Okay. Okay, so that's what you need to do. You just need to add what's unique, so you check to see if it's unique before you add it. Okay. So. Okay. That, that is, thank you. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Going once. Going twice. I'm going to say everybody have a good evening. I will try and have this up tomorrow. And um, good luck on the projects. If you're in my class, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Right, and thank you. You're welcome. Good night, everybody. Good night.